Hi, everyone. Welcome to another webinar with Rank Sense. I'm Brittany, and I'll just be going through the chat and answering some of your questions. Today's webinar will be hosted by my colleagues, Akshay and Christian. And we are very excited to be joined by our very special guest, Masaki Okazawa from AutoZone. Today, he's going to demonstrate how to analyze Google Search Console data with Python. So without further ado, let's get started. So, hi, everyone. I'm Akshay and I'll be hosting this uh, webinar for you, uh, along with Christian. Uh, Hello, everyone. Hi, Masaki. How's it going, everyone? Good. So, how are you doing? It's good. It's good. I, it's um, a lo lovely time to be here, actually. I'm very excited. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm very excited to share some of these um, scripts that I have today. Um, a lot of this is inherited from some of the things that I do use internally uh, at AutoZone, um, but it's just made with a little bit of edits just tailored towards the site that I'm working on uh, for, uh, for this uh, demonstration. But really looking forward to kind of unraveling some of, I guess, the mystery that is Python um, and then also making it a little bit more approachable for um, anyone who is interested in learning Python and you know, share some use cases on how it's useful for me and why I kind of started using it. Now, before we start, I'd um, like to know your educational background. Um, um, uh, if you did any uh, programming while in school or your undergrad. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so um, I, yeah, I graduated college in 2015 um, and I mm -hmm. studied communication. Um, so didn't really have a typical background overall in just SEO or marketing, um, but something that has helped me um, along my personal journey is just, I had a minor in computer science. Um, mm -hmm. I was, <laughs> long story short, you know, it was trying, it was itching to graduate. So couldn't <laughs> finish the CS degree, um, but you know, programming, even though I have like a background in programming a little bit, it doesn't really uh, apply to what I do today um, in particular. I mean, it does help with some of the um, familiarity of it all, but um, in terms of just learning Python and stuff like that, I would say that my journey there has really just started, you know, a little bit over a year ago um, because, you know, when I was in undergrad, I really studied like Java, you know, I studied like HTML, CSS, but never really tapped into Python. So what I'm doing today is really just, um, you know, something new to me, right? Um, and that's kind of what's exciting about Python in general is how approachable it is as a language. Um, I think my ongoing joke is that it's just executable pseudocode. Um, yeah. You can just read it and you know what's going on overall because the language is simplistic enough for um, general users to kind of read into it. So you you uh, were familiar with Python before, uh, a long time before, or did you just get to know it uh, recently for SEO purposes? Yeah, so I started, uh, I started learning Python in like September of 2019. Uh, the only reason I remember that was uh, there was a, um, presentation that came out from Tyler Reardon of Carfax at the time, um, now Chewy. Um, and he has this really fabulous deck that um, kind of emphasizes Jupyter Notebooks and um, Python uh, used for data science um, and how Jupyter Notebooks and Pandas library could be used to replace Excel in some cases when you're working with data. Um, and this really resonated with me at the time because I was in um, <laughs> spreadsheet hell and <laughs> all I did was just have tons and tons of spreadsheets all the time. Um, and then what really served as the catalyst for me to learn Python is the fact that AutoZone.com has, you know, over 6 million indexable pages. Um, when we're looking at and troubleshooting the site, we really need to kind of understand all the factors that come into play. And then even from a performance standpoint, when we pull from the GSC API um, and what has like ranking keywords, you know, it could be up to a million pages that have um, search query data. 
um, and something, and if you've ever tried to open up a, an Excel sheet with um, mm -hmm. 1 million rows, it's going to break, right? Even working mm -hmm. with 250,000 rows, um, it gets a little bit slow and cumbersome to work with. Um, and so, and the other thing that I wanted to do and just serve as an importance for my team specifically is reproducible work. Um, it should never be um, one person handles all of it. And the thing is, you don't have a track record of how the data is processed, how the data is presented internally in the organization. Um, if you're using Excel, because everything is what I, what I think is like ad-libbed analyses where you're just manipulating the data, fitting it however you need. Um, it's, it can be very difficult um, at scale, especially on certain um, analyses to be very reproducible. And then you can't pass it off to certain team members because you know, only this one person knows that um, cell A6 needs to be updated in this way, but then mm -hmm. cell A7 needs to be updated that way, right? So mm -hmm. there's no um, <laughs> clear, concise way to um, reproduce it. It has to be something that you kind of work with your team members to it. With Python, you pass them the scripts, you have the descriptions, and you, as long as you have, you know, sort of the initial understanding of what the data needs to be loaded in, um, the script does it for you, right? And you can track what needs to be done to reproduce those um, certain results. Yeah, for a person who has uh, used Excel sheets for for many years, the transition to use Python can be, you know, um, I don't know, is it difficult? Does it take a long time? Does it take weeks or months? What do you think? Uh, I would say it got me, it took me about four or five months to get up and running um, fully, like to feel very comfortable and um, with manipulating the data and figuring out how I want to do things. Um, the only reason why it took four months, uh, admittedly, is just because I don't have time. <laughs> I, I really am just doing this on the side. I'm not like a, trying to be a Pythonista. I'm not trying to be one of those people who are having Python projects on the side. So a lot of this, and like I said, previously mentioned, um, a lot of this, the catalyst was for just business needs. So um, I took the time to use Python where it's very applicable for me in my day-to-day -day work. And that really helps me kind of drive some of these scripts uh, to, I guess, production uh, for, for me, because um, there is a business need. I need to turn around from, um, from our leadership to answer some of these questions and I wanna make it re reproducible. And so um, for something like the script that I'm showing today, um, I don't anticipate it taking more than maybe like a month to really fully understand end to end to um, what we're trying to do here. It's because I kept it very simplistic. It is literally just making a bunch of pivot tables. It's <laughs> taking the data, uh, turning it into a, a pivot table um, and then graphing it. Um, and I think that, you know, while very simplistic, is a very powerful tool for um, a lot of SEOs who handle a large amount of data. Um, that where, you know, you could do it in Excel spreadsheet, but honestly, if I just throw up this um, script and, you know, hit control enter um, 17 times, I'm done. <laughs> and so that's, that's, uh, that's kind of the way I see about it um, because we need to be, you know, a little bit faster in our organization um, compared to our competitors. And so anything that we can do to speed up the process of these analyses um, really helps us accelerate compared to our competitors. Yeah, I think it's very important to contextualize the data also for other uh, people in your organization that's not primarily uh, working on SEO. Yeah. yeah, spend more time analyzing the data versus, <laughs> you know, getting the data to where you need to draw the insights. <laughs> And, and there are many, um, you know, uh, Python tutorials available on the internet, but they can really spread you out. You know, you have so many things that you can do on Python, but if you, I guess you, you need to find only those uh, tutorials which are helpful to you and just focus on things that matter. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that is partially, um, you know, some of the, you know, I think that there is a little bit of a walled garden when it comes to Python. Um, and the only reason for that, I say that, is because a lot of people jump into machine learning very quickly. Um, and I don't think as an SEO community, if we've really um, buckled down to say, hey, like these are some of the things that you can do um, with Python on a 
at its most basic level to help people get started. Um, when we jump into machine learning, you know, some of the difficulties that people will run into is one basic, you know, scripting <laughs> language and understanding that um, it's not very intuitive on how to train a model to make sure that it kind of fits what your business needs are going to be. Um, if you train it poorly, you're going to get, you know, a poor output, right? It's just computational statistics that way. And then, um, you know, sometimes it's, I think it's try to, trying to be a little bit grandiose, right? You know, you can do a lot of cool things to show, <laughs> show up with uh, Python, but at the end of the day, does it fit um, for the common person, right? For people who are just trying to learn, it, is it applicable for their business needs as SEOs? And I think that disconnect there is um, a little unfortunate, but I think that we can definitely do better as a community to kind of bridge that gap overall. I think it's a very common pitfall for uh, beginners to once they learn a new concept, they try to apply it to all, uh, all instances, not just the most appropriate ones. Yeah. It's very yeah. good to f focus and probably learning how to uh, pseudocode first and then uh, focusing on what you need to generate the, the goal. Uh, go to the goal that uh, you intended. Yeah, some people, some people tend to ask, um, you know, a simple question, let's just ask ourselves, why not Excel? What would you say? <laughs> I, I actually really like Excel. I'm not going to lie. I, I don't think that um, <laughs> Excel is a bad tool, right? Um, but there are some edge cases in which um, Excel can be very difficult to work with. And I think Python has some advantages um, over Excel. Um, the common case that everyone throws out is when your data set is way too large. Um, but the way I kind of constructed our scripts, because I know that not everyone has adopted Python in our organization, and I don't anticipate people adopting it anytime soon, and nor am I pushing it. Um, what, what I'm trying to do is use Python to take this very, very large data set and then trim it down into explorable spreadsheets for people um, from the business team to be able to draw insights from it. Um, but if you can't get over the first milestone of handling the big, large data set, you can't get to those little smaller subsets um, to get meaningful insights. So, um, I mean, that's my main case for Excel. Um, the other, or versus uh, Python versus Excel. Um, the other one being, um, we have repeatable use cases um, for data analyses where we, for example, search for like a part type um, on autozone.com. Um, and sometimes we have um, disconnects on what the customer is searching versus what the web taxonomy is going through. So we've designed a way to extract um, our part type groupings um, based off of URL structure, which I'm gonna show here um, in the script. And um, basically you'd be able to sort the distribution of different clicks uh, based off of different categories that we work uh, on. And then able to determine if there is um, a consolidation approach, if there is a renaming approach, if there is a, you know, you know, just end the part type because it doesn't match any customer intent at all and it's just wasted crawl space. Um, so those are some of the things that um, when we have it automated, now we can do tons and tons of these. We have over 5,000 part types. It's, it's almost trivial for us to review because we have it automated in such a way that we don't have to spend too, too much time getting the data wrangled and cleaned up and put together. Um, it's all automated. And then now our team can really focus on the analyses. Okay. Um, just a quick question uh, in chat. Uh, what resources did you use and uh, do you recommend for learning Python? Right, so I think um, a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of noise in the SA community for sure, but mm -hmm. I do think that um, some of the resources that I uh, look to a lot of the times, um, so that those that are SEO specific, I definitely recommend Tyler Reardon's um, presentation uh, at Advanced Search Summit. Um, he has a slideshare deck, I did tweet out, uh, tweet it out, so it is available, um, but it really does help encapsulate some of the justification on why to use Python. And he shows a really great example of how he manipulates the data with Ahrefs data. 
Um, mm. And I think it, it just shows some of the things, cool things that you can do to um, draw more insights from a data set. And then the other one is, uh, and I apologize if I like mispronounce her name, Julia. Um, she, so if you just search um, SEO data analysis in Python, she's like the first listing, um, uh, but she has an article on basic SEO data analysis where she combines um, Screaming Frog data with Google Analytics with Google Search Console. And I think that is, you know, after my script today, um, is a really, really great starting point to um, combine disparate um, uh, data sources and doing sort of the same analyses that something that a BI tool would do, but maybe you don't have access to, especially if you're a freelancer. Um, this is a way for you to um, combine the data and get insights. And then um, any, any of the uh, basic Python courses, like from Data Camp and everything like that, those are pretty good resources. But if you're trying to focus on, you know, actionable business um, related uh, type of scripting, um, mm -hmm. so th there's, it will get you to where you need and fundamental understanding. But I do think that um, from there, you'll have just a basic understanding where now you can open a Google Collab, um, uh, Jupyter Notebook that's out in, the, out in the wild and kind of understand the data. Um, and then I guess the last one that I will uh, throw out is uh, Brittany Mueller uh, from Moz. Um, she has a GitHub with all of her scripts on, um, you know, from ranging from machine learning to basic GSC analyses. Um, I do highly recommend reviewing that as well, um, just because it has such a wide range of applicable um, use cases for Python that it's, it, I, I can imagine it being very super, super valuable for someone who, um, wants to learn Python, but also wants to narrow um, the focus to just to just SEO related stuff, just because they kind of have short short time to really invest into it. Um, oh, do you have oh. any last advice for the audience before we switch to the demo? <laughs> well, if you're trying to learn Python. Um, what really helps is just learning from the community, community, but then also being very selective on what you're learning. Um, machine learning is great, but I think there are, you know, 20 steps before you get to machine learning um, to help train a model and do some really cool keyword categorizations. But if, if you're just looking to um, sort of automate some of the basic things that you already do in Excel, um, just trying to get faster at um, what you're doing and spending more time on analyses, what SEOs do best. Um, I highly recommend just learning the basics, learning pandas and, um, and, <laughs> and uh, learning just some of the ways, basic, uh, having a basic understanding of just data manipulation. Okay, great. Um, so we'll switch to the demo now, I'll stop sharing. Um, for everyone who's in the audience, I did post a link to the tutorial, and it is a just kind of a quick um, kind of excerpt of what we will be going through right now, if you want to go um, look at it later. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Can you yes. Uh, you can see your screen. All right. Awesome. So this is... Uh, my GSC <laughs> data analysis, uh, Jupyter Notebook. Um, I always construct my notebooks to be um, of a sort of format um, and methodology that I personally adopt only because um, it's easier for me to go off the rails a little bit on my analyses. Um, and so if I don't, I'm not using Python to uh, <laughs> kind of do a lot of exploratory data analysis. I'm trying to be purposeful on what I'm automating and trying to figure out and gain insights. So something that I like to do is just start on step zero is asking questions. And so this is a me, uh, this is something that I really try to instill in my team is that when you ask good questions of your data, you're gonna get better answers from your data. Um, anything's super vague, you're not really going to, you're, you're almost trying to serendipitously find it um, versus you know, really looking for it and drilling it down. So 
I ask questions. So in this example, we're going to ask, okay, what is the click-through rate for our search queries? Um, what is the ranking distribution of our search queries? Um, the top 10 categories by clicks on our site, what queries are experiencing cannibalization? And I try to define what uh, cannibalization is, meaning that there is one, more than one URL ranking for that query. And then what pages are driving clicks this year that did not drive clicks in the previous period? So um, when I ask these questions, it helps me think, okay, what data sources that I need? And I've constructed this script to be a little bit um, more approachable for anyone who wants to uh, learn and use this script. So I created a data studio report um, here so that if you wanted to go in, use this link, um, add your uh, search console data, and it'll automatically populate the way it's constructed for the script. So we're using two different um, data shapes, I guess you can say. One is the search console query report. So it's just query data, impressions, the deltas, clicks, deltas, et cetera. And then the search console landing page query report is <clears throat> the queries by landing page uh, with the same sort of performance metrics. And uh, why did you choose uh, to use Data Studio over the uh, Search Console API? Yeah, so that's a good question. So the Search Console API, um, one, there's some nuances with it when you're pulling it via Python. Um, for example, there's a max of 25,000 rows when you pull the Search Console API. So you need to keep looping on it. Um, in terms of like data collection, you know, it can be very, very, you know, cumbersome to keep getting from a um, large, large data set uh, because you can pull it via by day, you can pull it, pull it via by a date range. Um, so I, I, I figured that this would be just an easy way that someone who is familiar, and especially as a business user, I mean, I think about it from my team's approach. Um, how can they pull the data that I'm using, but then put it into a script? I don't expect people to uh, configure how to pull from the API. Um, yeah, I just think that there's a higher barrier to entry with that versus just taking this table, downloading the CSV, and then uploading it into the files. Cool. So um, after you pull the data, um, you kind of load the files in. So all you have to do is click browse, and then you can select what uh, reports that you're going into. Um, for this script particularly, you have to be um, candid on what what the file name you're referring to is. Um, so that's why I named it Search Console Landing Page Query Report and Search Console Query Report, because when we import the libraries and read in the CSV, this is what we're looking for when we, with the file uploads. Um, so you can change it however you need to. I mean, that's one way of doing it, but that's just how the script is designed so that you know what you're pulling from there. And so in this first uh, block here, we're just importing the basic libraries, nothing crazy, just pandas, numpy, and matplotlib. And if you've started working in Python, I mean, these are kind of the core um, Python libraries that a lot of people import. Um, all we're doing is reading in the CSV and then calling um, dot head, which is showing the first five rows of the data set. And so what this should be, search console query report, um, is similar to this data set right here um, into a Python data frame. And then something I do as sort of a best practice uh, for my scripts is take the shape of the data. So this is um, 23,450 rows and nine columns. Um, we can see that 23,450 rows. And then if I counted these, it should be nine columns. Um, I, I think it's very important just that when you're working with um, data manipulation, sometimes you want to check that your overall data shape is the same, or if you did manipulate it, it's the way you constructed it to. Um, so I just think that's the best practice to do um, when we're importing data initially. And then step two for me is always cleaning the data. So sometimes the data set that I'm importing is always, is imperfect. It's not the way I would want to work with it. Um, if you've ever, you know, added a column or reach it and rename some things just because it's better that way for um, users in Excel. Um, this is the way to kind of do it. You just call um, the data frame and then rename the columns. For, so we're finding the delta and renaming it to impressions difference, uh, et cetera, um, based on that. So 
the main difference here between these two is now delta becomes impressions difference, delta 0.1 is clicks difference. So it's just a better way to name the data so that if, if I were to export this into Excel for a business team, they are able to um, kind of infer what the difference is and what those names are. There was um, a question from the chat. Um, could you use this process to also highlight Core Web Vitals data or coverage issues? Yes, um, Core Web Vitals and um, that's a little bit of an interesting uh, question. So, um, are you are you talking about like when it comes to? I don't actually know the answer to that. So, when it comes to covering a core web vitals issues. So when you're pulling from like the API, I don't think you have core web vital information there. You would probably have to merge it and combine it with some uh, lighthouse exports that you're um, working with, but you can absolutely do that. But for, for, the, um, for the scope of this um, data set, like I don't think you can, um, it's just performance data on a query and landing page level. So um, going into um, just some of the renaming of the columns, something that um, you want to look into is finding null values. Um, so this is just a way to see if there's any um, nulls in your data set where it could potentially inhibit you from doing certain calculations. Um, so in this, we've seen that the impression difference, clicks difference, like click through rate difference, there's 8,325 rows with nulls in it. Um, and why that's important, and the reason why there, there are null values, if we were to take a look into is null, is because the impressions uh, difference, this is blank. And so, um, and the reason for this is that there, you know, from the Search Console data, there is um, this query didn't exist in the previous uh, period, right? Um, so that has like a null value. So if you wanted to, um, and I definitely encourage, you can change all of those null values to zero because you know that the reason why these are null is because there is zero performance available there. So um, this line here is just filling all of the null values and then uh, with zero and then doing the null sum to see and confirm if there's any continuing null values. I um, mean, in this case, there are none because we filled them all with zero. Why is it important um, to fill uh, uh, null objects with uh, values? Yeah, so we'll go into that a little bit um, later, but uh, the biggest thing is if you try to do um, calculations, so 46 minus null is null, <laughs> but 46 minus zero is 46, right? Um, so that's kind of, you'll run into errors when you do calculations like that, um, especially if you're trying to derive new columns um, in the data set. Um, so that's why cleaning up the null values is important so that you can do some of these calculations between different uh, data types. Uh, sorry, not data types, but between different columns so that you don't run into um, some of those errors. Cool. And then the last thing here is just data types. Um, so something about impressions is that they're always going to be an absolute value. So it's not really necessary to have it as a float. It can be an int because you're never, never going to have like decimal places for impressions based off of the Search Console data. Same thing with clicks. Um, so this is just a way. Um, and as you're working with more complex data, this becomes a little bit more important. Uh, admittedly, data types here is kind of, you know, it's OK to have, but it's not crazy if you don't have the data types all aligned. Um, but here, you know, we just changed some of the floats uh, for the differences, which should be ints into int64 um, data types. Um, but that's that's just cleaning the data. So these are some of all the initial steps that you may you may be doing already actually in Excel, but you're 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 not really thinking that it's a full step. It's just something that you do as like you know naturally, right? Um, cool. And so this is where it gets kind of fun. Um, and that's like the deriving the new columns and data frames. So this is um, finding, using your data and making more sense of it, right? Um, so I think we have a question. I just want to make sure. All right. So um, for this one, for deriving new columns and data frames, uh, this one here is like rounded position, right? So if we're thinking about um, click-through rate curve um, overall, um, 
So it, it's sometimes easier to calculate click-through rate curve by just bucketing into the nearest rounded position. So from there, all we do is call round by an absolute um, decimal place and then create a rounded position. So for the average position, which is 8.42, this gets bucketed into a rounded position eight. And so that's the first column that we create, a rounded position. Um, and then from there, this data here, because this is Google's data set, I'm just defining brand as it, um, if it contains Google and then it returns brand. If it doesn't contain Google, it's not brand. Um, and then we'll just apply this function over here to um, the data frame. And then this creates the brand versus non-brand um, column. So now what started out as like a basic GSC export now has rounded position and a brand versus non-brand on your query levels. And so now that we finished like deriving the new columns and data frames, we've also cleaned the data. Now we can get into the nitty gritty stuff, which is like the analysis portion of it. Um, and so a lot of this is just going to be basic pivot tables. So now that we have a clean data set, we can create a pivot table um, on an index of rounded position. So this is the index rounded position uh, where the value is the cyclic rate aggregated by the mean. So it's um, the average of all the click through rates. Um, and then it's sorted by the values of the rounded position um, for top bottom and then the top 10. So now we have a pivot table and this is our click through rate. Um, I didn't do the, <laughs> I was a little bit lazy. I didn't do the uh, um, percentage, you can convert these to percentages, but you know, if you know, this is 7.6% uh, click through rate. Um, and now we have, if we were to graph it, now we have a click through rate curve, right? And if I wanted to take this data and export it into Excel and make the chart pretty, pretty for someone, you can absolutely do that. Um, but I never had to, the data is already sorted. So, you know, I can graph it via Python, I can graph it via Excel, but I didn't have to take too many uh, steps with um, working with the data just to get to this point. So this, uh, uh, this plot tells us uh, uh, that the click-through rate is much higher for a higher position, is that right? Yeah, and that should be, um, that should be intentional, right? Uh, if you're in position one, you have a higher click-through rate for your total site. Um, and then position two, position three, position four, it just gradually declines overall. Um, so that's what we kind of expect from a click-through rate curve. Um, but then it gets a little weird with this data set uh, for brand versus non-brand. Um, if we were to break this out, we're taking the same data frame um, that we were working with, and we're just filtering on if the brand versus non-brand column includes brand or equals brand. Um, same thing, do a pivot table and it creates this. And then we graph the, um, the brand click through rate. And this is what I mean, but there's some abnormalities with this data set. Um, position three is like stupidly low, but position four is a little bit higher. Um, from what I can tell when I was doing a deeper, deeper analysis of this, it's just because uh, there's cannibalization and uh, lots of lots of brand saturation for Google merchandising. Uh, store. Um, so the click through rates can uh, often end up being a little bit funky because there's a lot of duplicate content on Google's side. Um, same thing with non brand filtering B equals non brand. Um, and then this is the click through rate curve for this one. Um, very strange, right? Non brand having seen one, two, and three being there. Um, again, when I was looking at it, it's kind of due to like the saturation of non brand search. Um, and some of the queries are um, a little bit interesting as to why they show up for Google. But, you know, this is just supposed to be a high level indicator of like how messy or strange of a, a site can be from a click through rate perspective. Um, uh, we, we just have a, we had a question uh, on the chat uh, that whether we can uh, focus our data set on a set of or a section of a website or a set of URLs with this, uh, with this uh, approach, is it possible? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you would probably need to import the URL data set. So right now we're only working with query data. Um, so on the query, but you can absolutely do it via um, a landing page perspective. Um, and I actually do show that um, 
it further down here when I get there. Um, but it's the same analyses. Um, it's just a different way of uh, extracting the data points. Um, all right, so I'll kind of go through here because again, a lots of pivot tables. So we're reshaping the same data frame um, to just have rounded position again as the index. But now we're counting the number of queries um, for each of those buckets. So now we have a distribution of our rankings when we um, graph it. So, I mean, if you look at this, it kind of looks like a bell curve, right? But it, it, what, you're, what you want to see is that a lot of your positions are in positions eight through um, 10, which means you're at the bottom of page one. How do we get more of our queries pushed over to two, three, four, um, even position one, ideally, right? Um, so if I were to do a deeper level analysis uh, to this, I would probably filter out on the ranking positions within this bucket to see if those are striking distance opportunities to improve rankings, right? Um, but this gives us like a high level overview of where um, from a search console perspective, where our queries are really being bucketed towards um, and how do we move the needle to get these in over towards position one. And then Again, breaking it out by brand versus non-brand, um, this <laughs> is kind of a problem, right? Uh, if you have brand ranking distribution between eight and 10, um, you know, that's a, again, Google problem. <laughs> um, and then the non-brand here, uh, we can see it's again, much more present that you know, there are more and more queries with eight to 10, how do we move the needle to that? And it has a much smaller um, non-brand count for uh, position one. Cool. So I'm going to pause there um, just in case anyone had any other questions before we get into sort of the second section uh, section of this. If anyone has any questions, uh, you can just uh, ask the questions over here. All right. So I'll keep moving forward. And then if there are any questions, we'll definitely kind of look into that. Um, so for the URL impressions, uh, this is uh, the second data source, right? So this is including the landing page here with the queries that they ranked for or that they showed up for with all the performance metrics, right? So because we've already imported these um, in the top of our script, I commented these out. But if you were to just have, work with just this section of the uh, script, you'll, you just want to import those again. So similar, we're just reading the data in overall. Um, and so this should match uh, what is here. And then I, again, as a best practice, I like to take the shape of the data um, just to see if it imported correctly or for whatever reason, even if I manipulate the data. So 43,421, 43,421. So we're good there. Um, and then the cleaning data, I already went through uh, this ad nauseum, but all I did was I took everything that we did step by step, put it in one code block, and so it's just run to clean up the data. Um, so this is where it gets kind of fun. So again, uh, driving new columns and data frames, but we're working with a, a different data set a little bit, right? Because we have the introduction of the landing page um, in this data. So from here, um, the way you can do this is um, based off of your URL structure, you can, if you have categories in your URL structure, you can extract them um, to create a um, category column. So in this one, I know it's a lot of like, <laughs> like different pieces of codes, but what this regex um, does is it looks for the fourth um, forward slash um, and then takes the uh, data that's right after that um, fourth forward slash. Um, and so what, what this ends up doing is that it extracts it, creates a new category column, which is right here, and then takes whatever you are trying to extract from that. So this, we are trying to extract apparel from the URL structure. So this is what we get an apparel called category or shop by brand. Um, and if it's null, um, you know, we can work with that on the data set. Um, and then this is honestly just for presentation purposes. Um, so you can see that this is like shot by brand. What I did was I removed uh, the plus symbols uh, in between just to make it like a little bit prettier from a um, sorting perspective or category perspective. Uh, but that's all that's all this code here. It just replaces the pluses and the minuses with um, spaces and then uses title case uh, for this. So that's why buy is capitalized. <laughs> 
All right, and then so from here, um, remember when I talked about like making sure null values are um, <laughs> gone? Uh, this is kind of one of the uh, cases that you want to remove nulls because you want to calculate um, the prior period. So for here, we have eight. Um, 823,278 um, impressions, um, and the impressions difference was zero. So the impressions uh, prior period was um, 823,278. Um, so it just kind of shows that there was no difference in the impressions as are on, same with clicks um, into the prior period, which is kind of crazy, right? But um, it kind of just shows the different calculations. If you were to try to do this with null, um, it wouldn't work out that way. Um, it would just, you would run into an error. Um, and then here, I wanted to show a um, different methodology on doing brand versus non-brand. Um, so in the previous example, we added brand versus non-brand as a new column. And this, what we're doing is making smaller data frames and um, filtering out for if it contains Google or if it doesn't contain Google. So it just um, takes the one big data frame that we were working with and then breaks it off into two separate data frames between brand and non-brand. Um, and that just kind of makes it, you know, it's just another way for us to just manipulate the data. Um, but the same thing here, it's just um, pivot tables um, sorted by category as the index, URL clicks um, sort of that way. And then now we have, you know, the top 10 URL clicks by category. Um, so we know that in this example for Google Merchandise Store, um, apparel seems to be the highest number of clicks. Um, what can we do to focus on bags, drinkware, clearance? Um, do we need more um, pages in these categories, um, et cetera? Um, same thing for brand, I broke it out. Uh, brand, same thing. Uh, apparel, accessories, stationery, what can we do to focus on some of these categories? And then in the non-brand, same pivot table <laughs> uh, graph. And then what we see here is, you know, we have no non-brand visibility for some of these. Um, how do we improve non-brand visibility for some of these um, lingering categories? Cool. And then last here is um, keyword cannibalization. So keyword cannibalization, um, we have landing page and query data. So if we use query as the index and sort by the count of each landing page, we have um, the highest number of landing uh, the queries and the number of landing pages that appeared for that query. Um, so what this tells me is like these, if we define um, cannibalization as something having more than one ranking URL for a query, um, this is kind of insightful to say, oh, well, we have 107 for these queries. It kind of makes sense in this case because it's a site search, but um, for different sites, you know, this can be, you know, very useful to determine if we have an oversaturation of keywords um, competing, and especially in the non-brand, um, which we can kind of see here for merchandise store, merchandising store. Um, if we were to kind of pull up um, why that is, um, it ends up being sort of a duplicate content problem for Google Merchandise Store and <laughs> Google Merchandise Store. So that's why you have a little bit of keyword cannibalization um, for the uh, non-brand here. And so that kind of helps kind of determine what needs to be, what, what is seen as like keyword cannibalization um, and then take these queries and focus on what needs to be um, relieved from a cannibalization standpoint. Um, cool. And then the last thing here, <laughs> I know there's a lot, um, is another way to reshape the data to um, see breakout queries. So when we're looking at a data set here that has a period versus a previous period, um, something that you wanna look at sometimes is what new queries did you acquire, right? And so if we were to take this uh, data frame and then reshape it, uh, again, sort of like a pivot table, but then reshaped it to um, clicks period, prior period equals zero. So basically what this means is if this saw no clicks in the previous period, um, let's filter out here. Now you have all the queries that you just gained um, from this period versus the last period, um, which ends up being 30,640 rows, uh, <laughs> which if you remember, um, 
when we took the shape of this data um, in the beginning, that's, you know, more than 50% of the queries are new <laughs> in for the merchandise at a store. Um, but that's, that's the last of it. That mm -hmm. is the script. Um, I know that there's a lot, I kind of jam packed it um, a bit with all of the analyses, but what I hope is that a lot of this is something that you can't easily get from something like a BI tool. And if you want to do ad hoc analyses, uh, you know, these are some of the white spaces that you, you know, can fill in um, with your analyses uh, moving forward. Uh, we do have some questions from the chat. Um, I think someone said that they're getting a key error on line 18. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I just stopped sharing my screen. Um, line 18, line 18. I'll, I'll probably have to take a look into that, but line 18 just seems to be the graph. Um, so it might be just an issue with, um, just uh, importing the data in. Yeah, debugging is going to take a lot of time. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, have another, we have another question uh, from Ellen. Um, so to sum it up, we can, for this, uh, in your process, we can use, uh, uh, we can set up Google Data Studio report. Then we export the CSV file and then use Python, Python to read that CSV file. Is that is that right? Yeah, um, I I do it this way um, for my team. So I, there's there's multiple ways you can do it. Um, we do it via like a SQL uh, SQL database. Um, you can do it via BigQuery. Uh, with but wherever your Search Console data kind of lives and where you want to do the analysis. Um, that's kind of where you pull it from. In this example, yes, I do Google Data Studio report because I think it is much easier for my team members and other business members to um, extract that data, export it, and then the Python script is there to do the processing for you. Um, yeah, I, I mean, this is just one way of taking the files in. It's not the only way. Okay. Um, we have one more question. Um... If we have more than 1 million rows in a CSV file and the data is not loading properly, what, what should we do? <laughs> well, if, um, if the data file is not uh, loading properly with Python, there might be something like corrupt with the file overall. <laughs> um, but if you're, if, you're, if you're able to, and it shouldn't be no problem. Uh, I've never had a problem in reading a CSV file that wasn't corrupted with a million plus rows um, with Python. Um, but if you've ever had to open up with Excel, it will probably break. Um, and I don't know the full answer to that, but I just know that uh, <laughs> I've never had a problem opening up a million rows for sure. <laughs> we have another question. Um, can we map search queries to see the lead generation from the SEO script, uh, from SEO using the script? Can we map search queries to see lead generation from SEO using the script? Um, yes. So it really depends on what your URLs are and what you know about your performance data. So if you know that, um, for example, like we know that on an e-commerce site, um, PDPs are very important. They have like the highest, like in terms of conversion. Um, so if we want to map the customer journey there, we can do it based off of subfolders and look into, okay, we got from this part type with this query, we got to this um, product detail page via this query, um, just kind of map those different intents um, from an AutoZone standpoint. I mean, the way you kind of, kind of see it is just like a broad category uh, search query and into the year make model, which is like the mid funnel search. Then we go map it down to candid um, product um, names um, and then just kind of go further into conversion. But you'll, you'll probably need additional data sets uh, to kind of inform that decision a little bit. If you use Adobe Analytics or Google Analytics, um, you just have to merge uh, those two data points um, using uh, the URL as the common um, merge join. Um, Ellen's asking, 
Have you ever used Python to get a blended model so you can view URLs by average position? Since the GSC URL impression data doesn't include average position, that's only included in GSC site impressions? Yeah, so that, that's another way you can uh, do it. So with the limitations of Data Studio and the API, um, you can combine those uh, two. Um, I, I know that some companies uh, do it a little bit different where they do it on a per query basis. Um, but what you'll kind of run into is um, if queries, um, if multiple pages uh, rank for the same query, there's only going to be one average position. So it kind of inflates your average position data, uh, depending on the analysis that you're doing. Um, so that's why I kept those separate for this instance, um, just so that we're working with just the URL data, we're just working with the query data. Um, but if you want to combine the average position together, you can most certainly can, but you're going to probably run into the weird cases of like finding an average position of an average or the average of an average position and stuff like that when you do all of the groupings. Uh, any, any last questions from the audience? I'll give everyone about a minute uh, up until then. I'm actually just going to tell you guys about the Rank Sense app. Yeah, so um, uh, Rank Sense is is an app that uh, app service that we, we provide. It is it is a very uh, it is an SEO solution for everyone to to uh, kind of make SEO changes to a website very easily without going into the back end and you know changing code or, or dealing with the developers or something. The Rank Sense app can help you uh, make uh, uh, metadata changes like uh, canonicals, uh, titles, meta descriptions, flow indexes, XML sitemaps, robots.txt images, and so on. There's, there's so much that you can do with the RankSense app, and that too very quickly. So you, you, you spend time, more time, in uh, trying to do SEO fixes than trying to get SEO fixes through a development team or through a long process in probably which your company has. So um, do try out our RankSense app. And uh, if you have any questions, you can always get back to us on support at ranksense.com and we'll be glad to answer your questions. I just wanna let everyone know that this video will be uploaded to our Rank Sense YouTube channel. I did put a, a link in the chat. You can actually go there now if you want and you can see some of our past videos. Um, you will also all be receiving an email that will have a link to this YouTube video once it is uploaded, as well as ways to contact um, Masaki as well as our hosts. Um, if you would like to follow us for more content, subscribe to our YouTube channel, um, as well as uh, follow us on Twitter. Um, if you want to see our tutorials, they're every Thursday, and you can follow the hashtag rtutorial to get updated whenever we post them. Um, so thank you all for coming. I want to thank um, our hosts, Akshay and Christian, and thank you very much to Masaki for joining us today. You did a really great job, and I'm really glad with how this turned out. Thank you all. <laughs>